Happy Devil Friday! We have a special edition of the State of the Fan Address. I am your host, Dan Wu, here with Pucks and Pitchfork Editor-in-Chief Nick Volano. All powered by Nova Product Design on the Primetime Radio Network. We have a special guest today. He's coming live from all the way from Israel, going into his eighth decade of covering hockey. The one and only, the maven, Stan Fischler. Stan, welcome to the State of the Fan Address. How are you today? Very well, thank you, and a uh, pleasure to be on with you guys. Oh, we are, I, am, I am all smiles today, Stan. I've been thinking about this all day. I went to bed early last night. I went to bed at 7 o'clock at night because I was just waiting for this day. I felt like a kid on Christmas. No, I was talking to Stan Fischler. This is just surreal. So I really appreciate you coming on and talking directly to the New Jersey Devils fans. You know, uh, when I, I think about what we're doing, I, I'm just amazed that uh, we're able to pull this thing off electronically, but it's nice. Uh, I mean, this has got to be a lot different than the days of tape delays and and all the other ways that we had to get hockey into homes back into you, – you if you look back even just to the 90s and, and the quality that, that we had to put out there, like that's – it wouldn't even be acceptable nowadays. It's so it's so crazy how how simple things have gotten and and I'm sure you're you're watching TV right now. You know you're watching the games on TV and you're you know the precision must. It's almost like it's live. The thing that's so amazing to me, and uh, I hesitate to say that today's fans are spoiled because they obviously weren't around in uh, my kid days. But mm. I can remember when, uh, say, about 1946, 1947, uh, you couldn't even get a Ranger game uh, uh, on the air. And when the Ranger games were on, uh, they came in after the first period. I used to pick up the Maple Leaf games from uh, CBL Toronto, which was uh, huh. between 710 and 770. So that would be about 735 on the dial. And uh, sometimes yeah, I'd get the games, the weather permitting, and sometimes weather was against it. Uh, that's the kind of stuff we had to put up with. Of course, uh, no television in those days at all. It was uh, all radio. Yeah, and, and that's kind of funny how that's like the one thing with sports that's just lived on is we still got the radio broadcast, and now the Devils, you know, going all in with it uh, with Matt Laughlin and Chico Resch. And, and what, what is that something that surprised you? Is that something that, that the, uh, I mean, there's people I know that will watch the games with the radio on. Is that something that surprised you that people are still just all in on radio? It's a, uh, it's a nice contrast. Uh, I actually, for a while I used to turn off, uh, I have the TV on, I would turn off the sound. This, of course, was not a game I was working, and uh, put on jazz and uh, oh, nice. listen to jazz and watch the game. So uh, a lot of a lot of ways you could play around with that. Uh, of course, when you mention uh, Chico and Matty, uh, two of my favorite people, uh, mm. last well, I should say last season, but uh, back around. Uh, the Christmas season when I was in town, I did uh, a few Matt and the Mavens uh, with Maddie, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, you, they've uh, you've done a lot of interesting work with the Devils this year. You, you've been writing some things, and, and you did the Matt and the Maven thing. How, how what what have you learned this season about this Devils team, and, and just kind of your your little spots here and there, being around the team and and around you know the guys who are here. Well, uh, having covered the Devils for a long time, I you know I got to know uh, certain guys well. Uh, was cert- I was certainly uh, disappointed in what happened to Corey Schneider. Uh, mm-hmm. Corey Schneider is very good goalie, uh, a class act. And when I say a class act, I'm referring to how he would uh, treat the media 
and me mm-hmm. in particular after a game he was always available if he had a bad game he owned up to it uh just a, a, a swell guy when you have guys like that having problems uh we're not supposed to get too emotionally involved but certainly i can talk about it now i which i felt felt sad about it. on the other hand i'm very pleased with the progress that blackwood has made mm-hmm. um it took a while uh, you just don't throw a goalie in with a with a bunch of younger guys and um i, I believe they got a real uh, a real number one goalie now real number one goalie the other thing that uh, a, a guy that i was very close to and was from the his rookie year was andy green i mean when mm-hmm. you think about it andy came out of nowhere he wasn't even drafted and uh, made a name for himself it was a very good uh lou lamorello move uh, getting andy and uh yeah not exactly a big guy on defense but a solid guy and uh, of course uh when he went over to the islanders uh, they would they would take him to get him but mm-hmm. as a fellow who was a uh, a lifelong devil which andy was uh a guy like me would have liked to see him uh finish his career as a devil on the other hand uh, this was a uh, a move that would be and was beneficial to him unfortunately he got hurt uh, Uh, too quick and that uh, that really was a, a, a bummer and uh, there were a lot of other guys on that team that I I, I feel uh, very close to I was very happy the way uh, Nico Isha came along uh, my son Simon uh, has very very strong connections with the sick uh, Swiss hockey group uh, in fact he's written quite a bit about Swiss hockey and mm-hmm. it was good to see kid uh, develop he's still developing he got used mm-hmm. is developing um uh, it's there's a difference between the event such as the draft and what the kid did that led to the draft and then translating to the NHL scene it's very very difficult very very difficult particularly when he's got other young guys like Nico around So um it's a team now in transition everybody i read uh the uh, analysts the experts uh they project the devils to uh, come along very well they are very pleased they were reading uh, uh, just about this kid smith who uh, looks like he's going to be a, a real hot shot on defense um things are going to be good Yeah, yeah, speaking of Smith, uh Smith just won um the WHL defenseman of the year and now he's going up for his second straight OHL defenseman of the year and I think that's the first time that would happen and you know there's been a lot of really good OHL defensemen um but you've seen a lot of kids come out of junior and and I'll mention Smith just to kind of get in your expertise about players you've seen, you know, he had a really bad preseason and it seemed like it was almost like a shock is that is that something that doubles fans should be worried about if a young player just has a bad preseason is there something that might not translate from juniors to the NHL or was that possibly just maybe sticker shock uh each case is different over the years i can tell you the greatest uh, jump from juniors to the NHL uh without any question uh would be uh, Henri Richard in uh, 1955 showing up at the Canadiens camp a little kind of skinny kid the rockets kid brother everything militated against success and uh coach Toe Blake of the Canadiens was very uh, skeptical about it uh he wasn't too keen uh, what the hell is this kid going to do Uh, but we'll let him, you know, we'll see what happens. So they have the first scrimmage and uh, the thought was that uh, they would send him back to juniors, but he was the best guy on the ice. Then mm. the second one and the third and uh, he, they couldn't get rid of him. Well, guess what? From that rookie season, he won five straight cups with the Canadians. 
Uh, Henri Richard won more cups than any other bar, any guy. He won 11 cups. That's one more than John Beliveau. So here's a kid, comes out of juniors, the odds stacked against him. Imagine, imagine having to play on the same team with his, the uh, immortal Rocket Richard. And uh, he was his own guy. Uh, at the beginning, the Rocket was uh, interfering if uh, the kid, uh, kid brother got into a fight. And Henri told him, listen, let me take care of my own. And as small as he was, he fought some of the best fighters in the league. Now, then you get uh, situations uh, that goes the other way, where a uh, kid comes up and uh, he doesn't click, doesn't click. And uh, you can't tell. You can't tell. Uh, a lot depends on the team he comes from, what kind of competition, and more importantly, the players that he's, he has his teammates. When you look at uh, he's playing on a team with Beliveau, uh, Doug Harvey, Boom Boom Jeffrey on. He, had a, he was surrounded by Hall of Famers, so that, that certainly is going to help a guy rather than somebody coming to a team that, that does not have superstars, and to, certainly to that number. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And that's, you know, it's, it's good to think about some of those players that, you know, didn't necessarily look their very best at the beginning and still turned into something, and some players that, went right from juniors and just dominated. Uh, but I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, we're obviously going through something unprecedented when it comes to sports, when it comes to hockey, uh, you know, c- putting a season on pause for such a long period of time. It- it's just something that most of us have never seen. But you you being a hockey historian, you've studied everything there, there, that's happened, uh, I'm sure, most seasons. Is there anything that – that fans of hockey can look at in the past. Maybe it's, you know, world wars or, or the Vietnam war or other pandemics that can make us think of what we might see when hockey comes back. Well, first of all, uh, this is unique. I mean, this Mm -hmm. is a pandemic that's been compared to the Spanish flu epidemic Mm -hmm. that canceled the uh, Stanley cup playoffs at the end of world war one. But uh, in terms of, uh, of my life, I started watching hockey in 1939. The only thing that you could compare this to remotely, remotely in terms of the uh, having a schedule was the uh, America's entry into World War II. Uh, mm-hmm. December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day was December 7th. The season, that was a 41 40 season season was on, but as the uh, uh, years progressed in uh, 42, 43, we were immersed in World War II. Uh, numbers of players were going into the uh, service. Uh, teams like the Rangers lost uh, most of their best players. Uh, the, uh, in fact, they, all the teams, with the exception of Montreal Canadiens, uh, had their rosters decimated and the kids were being brought up. Uh, uh, the Bruins had a 16 year old kid named Armin Gwidlin, Beth, uh, Beth Gwidlin. Uh, Harry Lumley was 17 year old goalie. These guys, uh, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the fact of the matter was there was a strong movement in 1942 to cancel the National Hockey League for the duration of the war. And, uh, of course, it was a 16 league at that time. And uh, there was a, a lot of lobbying done to persuade, particularly the Canadian government. The Canadian government was very, very iffy about it. And uh, the United States teams uh, lobbied hard. And, of course, the uh, seasons uh, went to the war. Now, I lived through that. I, I was watching uh, hockey. And what's interesting about it is a team like the Rangers, who lost so many, really, you know, the Rangers won the Cup in 1940. 1942, they finished first. And then one after another, the guy, most Patrick went into service, Lynn Patrick went into service, the goal, mm-hmm. they didn't have any goals. And, but what was really interesting is that the fans still loved the game. In fact, attendance grew uh, through the war. 
partially because uh, there was a lot of dough being made, and uh, but it, the game was considered essential for morale, essential for morale in Canada and in and in the states. And from my my viewpoint, I mean, of course, I was delighted that the, uh, the games continued. And uh, but uh, this is different. I mean, this is so different that. Uh, I'm almost uh, reluctant to compare it, but if you have to compare it with any period, it was from 1942 until the end of the war in 1945, when you had so many cockeyed rosters and so many unusual guys coming in for a game. And teams didn't have goalies. They were bringing goalies in from all of the kind of crazy places. And that's, that, that's uh, the closest uh, comparison. So uh, I don't know if you heard, but the uh, the latest reports are talking about 2014 playoff and having people do playing games and, and other that. But uh, it sounds to me like almost every situation, every agreement that the NHL is going to make with the players is going to have the devil's season over, and that could mean that you know they push next season back. What? What does a player have to do with 10 months of no hockey? I mean, we've seen players be injured and not play for 10 months, but a whole team just kind of being on ice, so to say, for so long. What's that going to do to the Devils in general? Well, you have to ask, uh, what's the alternative? Uh, Mm -hmm. The alternative is no National Hockey League. Uh, we're in a situation now uh, where everybody, in one way or another, has been in Barrett. You have to base your thinking on <clears throat> the owners of the hockey teams uh, and the players. Uh, you got the NHLPA, the Players Association, and you have the uh, NHL, and they're trying to make this thing work as best they can. And the odds have been terrific. I don't know I mean, to make this thing work in a situation where you may not even have any fans at these games. And you'll have mm-hmm. the, uh, uh, these games played in hub cities. Uh, as an example, Edmonton uh, is one. Uh, Las Vegas is another one that's being considered. But the trick is to be able to get through it, the trick. And I'm telling you something, I, I, I know that nobody is working harder on this than Gary Bettman, Bill Daly. Everybody is working together to trying to make it work. There's been a, the relationship now between the ownership and the players union has never been better. There's tremendous cooperation. Everybody realizes that this is a a, a unique, a traumatic uh, event, ongoing event, and the only way to look at it is to work together. And, and that's what I'm seeing happening. So the fact that uh, uh, <clears throat> devils may be uh, out for a longer uh, period of time, that's the way it is. That's the only way that this thing can be solved is making adjustments uh, very difficult adjustments, but that's the way it is. You know, in a, in, you know, this is a, the pandemic can be equated in some way with a war. I lived through World War II. Uh, we had rationing. You couldn't get gas. You couldn't get a car. You had to. Uh, you had to adjust. I, everybody had ration stamps. You wanted to buy uh, butter or you wanted to buy something. You had to give them uh, rations. So they had to adjust. But that's the way it was. We had to get through this, and we grinned. We we grinned and bared it. It was tough times. Tough times, and this is a very tough time. And uh, there are no better people. There are no better people than hockey people. No better people than hockey players. And no better people than the people who run the league. And they're going to make this work. Yeah, I have full confidence as well that we're going to see some summer hockey and it's going to be interesting and it's going to be different. But, I mean, I I kind of like the, the the things they're proposing. And I think that 
it'll be it'll be fun at least. It'll be a nice distraction. It'll be you know that's basically what sports is. It's just one big distraction. But you know, I, I think Stan, the reason why we're having you on today is because you're the best storyteller that I've ever seen in the history of the NHL. And I may be biased, but I actually think that I've been watching a lot of other teams games for a long time and I've never seen anybody come close to you. So I do want to hear some of those cool stories. Cause I know a lot of us were watching some of those old games. I know MSG is almost uh, exclusively running some of the old games, those old hockey games and a lot of old devils games. And I've actually gotten into uh, those DVDs that the Devils send out after some of those championship years. Uh, I've been through uh, some of the 2003, and I got through all of the 2000 year, kind of saving them for a day I need a little pick-me-up. Uh, so I do want to ask you about those cup teams, the ones that you followed and, and you got to see day in and day out. Uh, I want to kind of jump to 2000 first, because that is my personal favorite team, was the 2000 uh, New Jersey Devils, you know, with the R-Not, the A-Line. They were a lot of fun do you have any cool stories about their run to the Stanley Cup? I mean, a lot happened. They fired their coach right before the season. Do you have any interesting stories that you saw along the way with that team? Well, first of all, I was at the game in Detroit uh, when uh, Robbie Fatorik uh, threw the bench onto the ice. Uh, that was uh, that was really a- an episode that I I. I, I Frankly, that was right out of slop shot. And uh, yeah. what, happened, what happened was that Jay Pandolfo went into the corner and he was uh, egregiously fouled. He was badly hurt. I, I think they had about 45 stitches taken. Uh, in any event, uh, there was no penalty call on the play. Now, being a pretty emotional guy myself, I was uh, appalled by it, and I can I, I can uh, I can relate to uh, Robbie Fatori, and I, I believe that the uh, bench throwing was what eventually led to uh, his getting fired. But uh, that was that was a crazy a crazy thing, and of course, then uh, we came to the playoffs. I was uh, I remember the overtime game. Um, with Dallas at the Meadowlands, uh, the one that we lost, which uh, to me was one of the toughest, toughest losses. But of course, uh, we go we go to Dallas. Uh, the interesting thing about the game in Dallas was that when it went into overtime, the visitors, meaning us, the visiting TV. We had to camp in front of a, a monitor, a little monitor that was uh, uh, placed in the bowels of the arena, but surrounded by other uh, TV media people. And the game was going on on the ice, and we could only hear the crowd and you know uh, reaction. And I remember time and again hearing the crowd roar. You know the Dallas fans roar. And uh, uh, this is it. And of course, when uh, Jason Warren had scored the goal, it was uh, the, the perfect ending in the perfect place. If it had been the other way, it would have been the worst ending in the worst place. But uh, uh, it's funny because lots of times we have been in situations. We were in we were in Ottawa, uh, that tremendous series with with, with Ottawa. And uh, I remember again we were in a, a, a situation where we weren't, we, you know, we did we weren't actually uh, seeing the thing live because it was overtime, and then they had to cut right back to us, so we had to be down there. And uh, I, I have to tell you, that was uh, uh, I wasn't very fond of the uh, of the guys in Ottawa and winning that game, even in Dallas. You know, you get to you you. It's like them against us, and uh, mm. I feel you know. I feel like when we're like that, we're like a player. And of course, being emotional myself, I, I really was uh, uh, quite uh, quite happy that uh, we beat those bums. <laughs> they were bums, yeah. though. They were really good. It was a phenomenal. You know, when you think back, because uh, I, I was uh, uh, pals with uh, Patrick Eliash. Uh, 
Patrick Elias nearly died uh, from that hepatitis. A lot of people don't realize mm -hmm. how close, what a terrible time it was and how long he, uh, he had in his recovery. But a very cere cerebral guy. He's a funny guy. Uh, every, he had a great sense of humor. I got to tell you one uh, Patrick Elias story. I've never told this before. before. So uh, when I'm doing post game in the dressing room, I don't like to bore uh, the players with a long-winded question, particularly if we're talking about uh, uh, the, the particular game. And every once in a while, uh, I would be uh, in such a desire to make it quick. I would simply say, go up to a guy, let's say I was, uh, I was going up to a Kurt Muller, when he was uh, mm -hmm. captain of the Devils, and I'd say, uh, uh, your thoughts on the game. I, I Sometimes I'd edit it down to your thoughts. <laughs> so <laughs> one night after a game, I walk over to uh, Patrick Elias with my mic, and I say, I'm about to open my mouth, and he says to me, your thoughts. <laughs> and uh, he, he was a great guy, and of course, the, the, that, that pass, that pass was just right out of a textbook, and that was a, that was something. But uh, I was discussing with a very good friend of mine uh, uh, which of the which devil, which was your best, which did you consider the best devil team? And I picked the uh, the two thousand Cup winners uh, because they had, of course, they had to go through that Ottawa series, and uh, and then and then Dallas. And uh, Marty Brodeur was at his best. I, I thought Marty Brodeur uh, was much better uh, in 2000 than he was in the 2003 series against Anaheim. There were some goals I, I wasn't too crazy about, but uh, I thought Marty was best. Uh, my friend uh, said that he thought the best Devils team was the 93-94 team that got beat by the Rangers. And uh, I could understand he made some very, very good points. There were terrific guys on that team. Uh, I will say this, and, uh, you know, as a uh, journalist and you guys, or even as fans, you look back at certain episodes that you know would have changed the outcome, win or lose, if they were done right. And after all, uh, when... Uh, uh, Zell Pukin scored that tying goal and Richter came out and he bumped the referee. I mean, hey, not even a, a two-minute penalty? This was, this was insane. It was insane. He made contact with the guy. Now, had there been uh, the penalty, which there should have been, should have been, McCreary blew it, no question about that. But had there been... Um, uh, a penalty on that play, who knows Who knows what would have happened? I mean, uh, a goal and uh, goodbye, Charlie, and that's, that's it. But you see, when William Shakespeare uh, wrote his plays, he had some wonderful things that could apply to hockey. And uh, in this case, the line was, there's much virtue in if. So we can if till the cows come home. There was no penalty. And, but getting back to my friend Vic's uh, point, and that is, that was a tremendous, that was a tremendous hockey team, tremendous hockey team uh, that the Devils had. And uh, uh, I think the strategy changed uh, for the worse. I, I remember very vividly because I, I interviewed, it was that, it was the, uh, we had a two nothing lead. And, and even in the overtime, in the overtime, Billy Guerin had a terrific opportunity. He had the puck, uh, and Richter was behind the net, and he just couldn't come around and uh, put it in the empty net. But, you know, uh, this was a very, very good team. But, like I said, I picked the 2000 team because they won the Cup. And I will say this. One other thing, and that is, no question, anybody I've ever asked about this, who is the best coach? Jacques Lemaire. Mm. I asked this to Bobby Halik uh, maybe a year or so ago because Bobby came out to Israel and he, he taught at the, uh, at the hockey school 
for two summers. And I said to Bobby, Bobby, uh, who was the best coach you ever had? He said, Jacques Lemaire, and there was nobody in second place. Uh, and, of course, uh, Jacques coached that team. Wow. Stan, um, just switching gears, one of my probably the all-time favorites of mine, one of the, the Stan Fischler moment as a journalist, and, and, I, and I always go back to it, and I, I've always wanted to ask you, that interview you did with Gary Bettman in regards to Nashville, that the Devils are moving to Nashville, those were the toughest questions. I, I, I mean, it's Gary Bettman to me, but then again, I thought about it. Going back then, it's about he was four or five years uh, into his tenure as commissioner of the league, but how do you have the intestinal fortitude and just a stomach just to go up and just go for the jugular and ask those tough questions, even though, you know, he tried to dance around it, but you just kept on at it, at it, at it. Like what was going through your mind before going there? Were you nervous? I, I, I would have been nervous to, to you were nervous for your career, just to just do something like that. Or, to, I mean, it was great. Well, it, was, I, it was to the point. I was angry. That's what I was. I was angry because uh, this was a situation where the team might leave. And um, <laughs> I was doing these games, and I don't want this team being taken away from me. And uh, it's uh, every, every once in a while, you get into a situation where you have to speak for the fans. Now, what the fans are thinking? Well, no matter how you look at it, if you cover a team for a long time, you become a fan of the team, whether you like it or not. And it's, it's part of the deal. And I spoke, I spoke a, as, as a fan. And it was a question, questions, questions uh, had to be done. I'll give you another example, because uh, I've done Islander games. And uh, when the Tavares situation came up and he accepted the uh, Toronto deal, uh, there was a conference call, and uh, I was on that conference call, and I hit him hard uh, with the questions. Uh, and uh, a, a lot was made about the questions, particularly by, by Islander fans, reacting, uh, in a sense, the way you have uh, to the uh, thing with Bettman, uh, you know. Uh, but I was angry. I was angry about uh, him uh, going to Toronto, and uh, and uh, that was it. That was it. Uh, you know, there are times when you uh, uh, when you have to uh, go with the fastball. That's all there is to it. And um, otherwise, why be in the business? Because 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 really, the people who are watching uh, they get disgusted. They want, they want, they want, they want to, they want this kind of stuff. They want the fastball. That's, uh, that's part of the deal. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that, uh, I oh, think the ahead. fans are thinking something, uh, something similar right now where, uh, a lot of things are happening with the devils and a lot of people aren't asking a lot of the right questions, but you know, the devils are in a weird place right now with no GM, no, no, no head coach. Well, you know they have Elaine Nazardine, but they don't have like uh, he's the interim head coach, and and a lot of decision makers aren't in place. But you know what's what's something from this Devils team that you think is where do you think this Devils team needs a little more accountability? I mean, this is the worst stretch they've had since uh, they came into the league in '82. So where 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 on this Devils team do you think? Some questions need to be answered. Well, you have to go back to the uh, what has been the season so far. And mm -hmm. they've had some very, very difficult things happening to them, uh, going back to Corey Schneider's injury, uh, uncertainty in goal, and uh, uh, changing of the coach. Uh, it's It's been a... Uh, tumultuous season and uh, tumultuous seasons happen <laughs> you know uh, you can never uh, hockey is impossible to figure you, you uh, 
uh, you know, the look, you look at a uh, club like the Rangers, they were uh, a million miles behind and then uh, they, they suddenly get hot. Nobody, nobody uh, could have predicted that. Uh, what is uh, optimistic and what is gra gratifying, heartening about the Devils is that they have a lot of young talents which will be uh, put in the uh, uh, on on the right track uh, by the proper coach and GM. Now they're in a position now where they're uh, deciding uh, whether or not Tommy Fitz is going to be the GM. That would be my choice. I, uh, of course, I have uh, ties with uh, Tommy going back to uh, the Islanders in the '93 playoffs. Uh, but he's a smart fellow. And uh, if they get somebody else, uh, it'll be somebody they think is better than Tommy Fitz. So they gonna, you can't go wrong uh, if you're going to get somebody who's smarter than Tommy Fitz. I like the guy. And uh, the coach situation, uh, the interesting thing now and the positive thing now is that they have time to evaluate. There's uh, not a lot of, we got to do it this minute. We got to satisfy the fans. Uh, it goes back to uh, what, what I said. This is the; these are unusual times. I don't see anything right now where I would have a beef with uh, what the high command has done. Uh, and uh, like you, like uh, me, and like the fact, we don't even know what's going to be uh, the owners. And the union have been talking. Uh, we haven't even reached phase two, uh, that uh, the uh, league is going to hopefully move into, hopefully soon, hopefully soon. Um, uh, things are, what's, what's pleasing to me is that there's a feeling of positivity, of optimism uh, from the commissioner, from Bill Daly, his, his deputy, uh, general managers. Um, people are talking like there is going to be a season. And uh, so le let's hope. But uh, right now, I, we're in such a traumatic time with the pandemic that uh, you've got to think positively. That's the way it is. You have to accent, ac accentuate the positive. We're, we're, uh, and this is what's happening now with the NHL. But this is a, a major, major challenge that uh, I've never seen before in, uh, in my life as, as a journalist. It's, uh, it's not like pick, picking a uh, uh, who's going to be the number one goalie or who's, uh, who are we going to start tonight, uh, you know, uh, questions like that. I happen to be a an A's fan, a baseball athletics fan. And I remember when it came down to that big choice in the playoffs, they picked the wrong pitcher. Well, at that time, it looked like the end of the world. <laughs> they got yeah. killed on that one. So, but this is, this is a more serious thing. And it's being addressed, and it's being in the addressed in the best possible way. It's not a casual thing. It's one, you know, they're going over every single thing. Well, even, I've even heard talk that they're going to have allow fans to be uh, in the arenas, but they'll be separated, you know, like four seats apart. Four seats apart. It's being, everything is being analyzed very, very carefully, and that's the way it should be. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I do want to kind of look into, you brought up Kirk Muller, uh, earlier and, and talking to him, the former captain of the devils and his name came up into the zeitgeist a little, uh, I think it was earlier this week because NHL and NBC sports put out the greatest devils lineup of all time, where they just picked the best players at each position and they put Mueller at center. And I know a lot of people were kind of questioning that they're like, Oh, he played in the eighties. He had all those eighties points. Nobody was playing defense, yada, yada, yada. And I think a lot of people, A, because he played so long ago, and B, because he wasn't on those championship Devils teams, I feel like he might be a little bit underrated overall. Now, I'm a little, you know, he was just barely before my time, but 
Maybe explain to me what it was like to watch Kirk Muller. I mean, his stats say one heck of a story about his career with the Devils. Maybe you could tell us what you saw on the ice when Kirk Muller was a part of this franchise. Well, first of all, the when you talk about Kirk Muller, you got to talk about the way in which the Devils wound up with Kirk Muller. Now, they were uh, uh, not a very good hockey team at that time, and they were coached by Tommy McVie. Uh, Dr. John McMullen was the owner, and when it came down to the stretch, obviously everybody was looking uh, at Mario Lemieux as the obvious number one pick. Now, if you look at what the Penguins did in the uh, last couple of games, throwing in American leaguers, they weren't throwing in those the American leaguers because they wanted to win. They wanted to get uh, Lemieux. Now, to the credit of Tommy McVie and Dr. John McMullen, they said, we're going to play every game to win. I'll never forget that. And to this day, to this day, I resent what the Penguins did. I commend uh, McMullen and McVie because they did the right thing. And uh, we got Kirk Muller. We got a hardworking play. He certainly... Uh, didn't have the comprehensive skills that uh, Mario Lemieux had, but a, a good leader, a, a, a good captain. Now, uh, what happened uh, with Kirk Muller is what happened with uh, certain other players. Uh, he went up against Lou Lamorello, and uh, when you up, go up against Lou Lamorello in certain uh, contractual situations or other type of situations where uh, you are doing, uh, you are displeasing the guy running the team, then you go bye-bye. That's it. Uh, uh, my way or the highway, whatever way you want to put. So uh, Kirk Muller left. Now, I, of course, I followed Kirk uh, from his uh, coming to the New York Islanders. Uh, he disappointed me then. Disappointed me in no end. Um, I, uh, I'll throw one at you. Who would you pick as your best center? It, it depends on how you're looking at it. Um, if you're looking at it season by season, um, I'd probably pick Arnott personally, but that's just because I watched him. I saw how good he was with this team. Um, obviously, his career numbers don't look as good as Muller's, uh, but I think how good he the, – the point he was in his career – when he joined this Devils team and just how good he was in that moment, uh, I think it's it's hard to deny him. I would have at least picked uh, – I, I mean, another one that they're interesting, they picked the extras, Bobby Holik, and he's another guy that I think has an underrated career overall. So, I, I, you well, know, it's – Let me tell you something. I never, I never would have picked Kirk Muller. Never would have picked Kirk Muller. Uh as I said, he was a very efficient, hardworking uh, player, uh, a leader. I would definitely uh, put Bobby Halik right up at the top. Bobby Halik was a phenomenal player. When you think about what Bobby Halik, Bobby Halik turned the fourth line into one of the best lines in the league. Now, Randy McKay, Peluso, they were... Uh, Wonderful compliments to uh, Bobby Halik. Uh, and Bobby Halik uh, said uh, he felt he, he deserved being on a higher, lane, a higher line. But, uh, um, you know, uh, when you asked me the question, I, I was toying with uh, Arnott. Uh, and, I, and you can make a good case for Arnott. And that Arnott line, that A line, was a terrific, terrific line. Terrific line, as was the crash line, uh, a terrific line. The thing that Bobby Halik had over Arnott was that Bobby made more of his strength. Uh, Bobby was a chippy player, and uh, you need chippy players like that. <laughs> I, I had a running gag with Bobby. Uh, he once got, uh, I, I forget who the guy was he pulled down. 
but uh, he was a- accused of kicking skates. They had another word for it. I forget what it was. And uh, I defended Bobby. I didn't think it was uh, was a, a penalty. Uh, but the thing was that uh, Jason Jason reminded me. Jason on it was the devil's answer to Jean Beliveau. He was a majestic center, a big guy, and uh, let's face it, uh, his goal was one of the most uh, enjoyable goals I've ever seen any season, any team, anywhere. I mean, uh, and uh, so uh, I would say Jason or Halik even depending on which kind of player you would like, but uh, uh, both of them over Muller. Speaking of Kirk Muller, uh, I'm a little bit older uh, than Nick Stan, so I remember the 80s. I was probably around six, seven years old when uh, that whole thing with Lemieux and Kirk Muller went down about the tanking and, and whatnot. But... And, and I always held a grudge against it because I've always thought that Mario Lemieux is like the greatest center that's ever played. And it's debatable. I, in my opinion, I would pick him over Gretzky, but that's just me. Uh, from what I saw, big centermen, soft hands, can skate, leader, can even own a team and play as a player owner. Um, that scenario. But you wrote an article, I remember, after 2003 Cup about that incident with Kirk Muller. I don't know if you remember this article, but I held this grudge this whole time because I always felt the devil should have had Mario Lemieux. But somewhere in the article, if I remember correctly, you said, but in the end, Lemieux had two cups, the devils had three. And that that grudge went away instantly after reading your article. Do you remember that article? Because that then it just made total sense to me. And I was like, oh, I love Captain Kirk, but you know what? We got three cups after winning 2003. Do you remember that article? Because that was a very, very well-written article about that moment and what had transpired. And, and you know, without that trade, Kirk Muller, you wouldn't have had these players and this player. And, and then Scott Stevens came. And, you know, it just it all just stars aligned in the end. And the Devils three, the Penguins two after that. Do you remember that article? I remember the article now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sam, there are, uh, I, I write a lot of stuff, and I remember a lot of stuff. And now that you mention it, uh, I liked my punchline. <laughs> I always like to uh, finish a piece with a good punchline. And I have to uh, pat myself on the back. Oh, I think we lost Stan there. Sorry for the technical difficulties. He's just getting to the punchline. Sorry, Stan. He's back. The thing, the thing is that uh, being so emotionally involved with the team, with Tommy McVie, uh, with Doc Mack, who was a personal friend, uh, and that you know they stayed on the straight and narrow path the way they should. The Penguins didn't. And, uh, you know, looking backward, we did the right thing. They didn't. And Mario only got two cups. And I was there. I was there when they got knocked out by the Islanders in their quest for that uh, uh, third cup. That Mm -hmm. was something. They got what they deserved. You know, it, it tells you how impactful journalists are. Because I still remember this article to this day. When I read that article, I I was just, I was like, you know what? That grudge is gone. Now, the Mickey Mouse thing, uh, I think I was just a little bit too young. But that's how Simon, you told me before, that's how Simon became a Devils fan, right? After, after that game? Yes. Uh, I remember driving home from an Islander game, listening to the broadcast from uh, Edmonton. Uh, I was with my buddy, George Valkowski, and uh, then reading about the Mickey Mouse thing. Because of the time difference, Edmonton and the East, uh, 
it really wasn't made into a big deal until a couple of days after. And uh, eventually the Oilers uh, came to the Meadowlands and my son Simon <clears throat> was relatively new to hockey. Uh, my wife Shirley uh, brought him to the game and uh, he sat close to the glass. That was also the game where I did some funny stuff with Glenn Sather. I did a picture, uh, I, I think he came on on camera with me and I was wearing uh, one of those ridiculous Mickey Mouse hats, you know. We had some fun with it. And of course, uh, uh, Chico played a terrific game, Chico Resch, and Simon was sitting at the glass uh, at uh, you know, Chico's end for two periods and uh, he became a Devils fan at that particular game. The Devils got beat, but in the end, the way they played, they played so hard, uh, they may have lost by numbers, but they won in, in, in spirit. That was a very, very important turnabout game for them. They gave, they gave the Oilers everything they had. There was nothing left in the tank. And that, that's the way a hockey fan is made. That's the way, to this day, uh, Chico Resch is a very dear friend of the family, a friend of Simon, a friend of mine. I talk to Chico regularly. Wonderful guy. Yeah, we just had him on last Sunday. Um, but uh, uh, in the Facebook Live, we have a, a question for you from David Decker, uh, Stan. Uh, what is your favorite Martin Brodeur moment? Would have to be would have to be, oddly enough, uh, the 95 uh, Cup Final. <laughs> that's, that's one of them. I don't know where you got that one from, but that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's post-game. But in terms of the broadcast, the actual broadcast, uh, in Detroit, when uh, they started throwing the octopi on the ice. And I remember. Oh, lost Sands feed there. Sorry about that, everybody. We're just having some technical difficulties. Yeah. Get him back up. I, I, I think it inspired him. It inspired him. Nick? Oh, yeah. No, I, I mean, uh, you know, Stan, we're, we're coming to the end of it. So, uh, you know, just uh, one more thing. I just wanted to see what what was the moment where you think the Devils arrived as a, you know, as that team? Uh, do you think that 94 in that Ranger series was the moment where you're like, this is going to be a good team for a long time? Or did it go back even further? I know that Ken Danico talks very – lovingly about that 88 team that first made the playoffs and then went all the way to the, the Eastern Conference Finals. What what was the moment that you saw from this Devils team that you were like, this is going to be a team that's going to be good for a long time? Uh, if you will permit, I'll take uh, two rather than one. Uh, certainly, there you go. certainly, Dano, uh, I mean, that 88 thing was one of the most exciting melodramas I ever experienced and uh, wow, you know, the ending and, and the fact that they knocked out the Rangers. That was, that was enormous, enormous. Uh, but I also go to the uh, series with the Rangers, the seven game series, uh, when Marty uh, actually made his debut when Tommy McVie was coaching and uh, they gave the Rangers a, a tremendous run Tremendous run. Um, that was the uh, seven-game series in uh, in '93. Uh, I, I bring you back up. The, the manner in which it happened. Uh, I'll I'll start with that one. Made me happy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Stan, thank you so much for taking the time, coming on to our podcast. Just the stories, uh, it, it brought back a lot of memories. It, it, it was very good talking to you. The, the Facebook Live in the middle of the day here, uh, 
Um, lunchtime uh, has been humming and over social media with Facebook Live, Twitter, Periscope, YouTube Live with all questions, comments, and, and all that. It's a real treat and a special uh, honor to have you on our podcast. Uh, I know Nick and I have talked about you know your career, uh, the eight decades, and and, and we feel strongly that. Uh, that one day you will be in the Hockey Hall of Fame as a builder because you tell a story like no other, and it comes from the heart and uh, learning today. And I always learn something from you from all these interviews, but learning today that you were angry when you asked Gary Bettman that because at the end of the day, there's only so many spaces in that locker room to ask questions. And we feel like as fans, like you represent us asking those tough questions uh, no BS, no politics, just ask those questions that we want to hear. And it re really appreciate, uh, all you've done. Well, it's uh, great to be with you guys. As you probably know by now, I like to schmooze and this is a good schmooze. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, you're more, this was, um, this is a podcast that I've been looking forward to for, for a long time. And, and honestly, like when I reached out to you, I was a little nervous cause you know, you, you want these things to go well and you want the people to be like you always thought they were going to be and you're everything and more. And the, honestly, I, this felt like we've been talking for five minutes. I looked down and it's been an hour already. And I'm like, Oh my God, goodness. Like spending this much time with, with Stan, the maven of all people. And, you know, as Stan said, I, I can't wait to see you one day get enshrined into the hockey hall of fame. And, you know, I will not rest. I, I told you I had a good night's sleep. So now I have you know, don't, don't, rest. don't rush with the Hall of Fame. I got plenty of time for that. What I do, <laughs> what I would like to do is you have me on with my son, Simon, when he's feeling better, and let him tell you the story of that uh, post-Mickey Mouse night when he became a fan. That would be great to hear it from his, his viewpoint. Oh, I mean, well, you tell us when and where, and we'll make it happen. Thank you so much, Stan, for coming on. Okay, guys. Thank you for everybody that's joining in. We'll be back uh, this Sunday. We have Jim Dowd in the virtual studio and Pete uh, Canarosi and Kevin Clark will also guest the host filling in. Uh, next week, uh, we have Corey Mathisak here on the State of the Fan Address Wednesday. And we have a special guest from Toronto coming in the following week, but we're not going to blow the surprise. Till next time, Devils fans, let's go Devils.